Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, did you watch the World Baseball Classic last week? It was a wonderful tournament. It was exciting. In that semi-final game, Team Japan versus Team Mexico, it came down to the very last inning. There was little hope for Japan unless they would score a run to tie or score two runs to win. Bottom of the ninth inning. Japan comes up. The first two batters get on base. And then the third batter comes up. And I don't know how many outs there were, but he was their last hope. And he gets up into the batter's box. The pitch is thrown, and he hits the ball high and far out into center field. Will it go over the fence for a home run, or will it get caught for an out? Neither. It hits the base of the wall. And so the runners are running all the way around. The first runner scores. The game is tied. And then the second runner scores. And it is a walk-off double. And Japan wins the game and is able to go on to the finals, the championship game against Team USA. They were down to their last hope, but then they got victory. Today we continue with our Lenten series on the Chronicles of the King. It is about the good kings of Judah, as found in 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles. You'll also find parallel readings from 1 Kings and 2 Kings, and sometimes those readings shed even more light about the different kings that we have been looking at. And so we started with King David, and then Asa, Jehoshaphat, Joash, Uzziah. And today we are looking at King Josiah. And King Josiah was a good king, just like all the others. And when we look back on the life of these kings, we notice that they were considered good kings, but they were also going through many challenges. Some of them remained faithful to God. Some of them fell into sin, but repented. Some fell away from God and did not return. So we see in these kings that they had their highs and their lows, their ups and their downs, their peaks and their valleys. And when I reflect on these kings, I see it as a reflection, a microcosm of our very own spiritual journey. That we also walk through those times of spiritual darkness. When we feel God is far away. And then we feel at other times, periods of spiritual strength that God is working powerfully in my life. And then I go through periods of doubt and questioning God. And then I get restored and I'm renewed and I'm reinvigorated. And then I begin to doubt and question God. And so it goes. Highs and lows, peaks and valleys in our spiritual journey. But as we make those journeys, as we go through the highs and lows, they go up higher and lower. And what we experience is that God's grace is sufficient for all of those. When we are high or when we are low, it is a journey toward God's grace, for God is with us through our spiritual walk. That there is never a time when he is not present with us, to be there with us, to encourage us and uplift us. So if you are going through any dark valleys now, God will lift you up. And if you are going through that time of spiritual strength, God bless you. May you share that. May it overflow in your life to others. You see King Josiah, a good king, and he too had his ups and downs. He started out as a very good king, which is contrast to his grandfather Manasseh, who reigned for 55 years and was known as one of the worst kings of Judah. Or Josiah's father, Ammon. He reigned only two years, and he was so terrible that he was actually assassinated. And so Josiah became king at a very young age. 
eight years old. The youngest king, other than Joash, who we looked at a couple of weeks ago. Joash became king and began to reign when he was only seven years old. And Joash had his uncle, the priest Jehoiada, who was there to guide him and lead him and counsel him and to be a mentor. But we don't hear about any such person in Josiah's life. And yet he reigned effectively. And he was influenced by others in a positive way so that he followed after his father David. He was able to walk in his footsteps and restore the temple and to follow again the commands of God. And while he was having the temple restored, they discovered something. The book of Moses, the book of the covenant, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And the prophet Hilkiah read it to Joash, to Josiah. And Josiah heard that and it touched his heart so that he implemented even more reforms, and he got rid of the idols in the temple, and he proclaimed that the word should be read to all the people, and it became a national time of repentance, so the whole nation was renewed, and Josiah established and renewed a covenant with God, and so Josiah was a good king. We can't even say he was a great king because of the restoration that he provided and how it blessed so many of the people who came back to the Lord. And then what also stands out about this king, Josiah. He had his highs, but like the others, like we do, he had a low moment and it would prove to be devastating. Nico, the pharaoh, king of Egypt, wanted to bring his army through the land of Judah. He wanted to go north to Carchemish to fight against the Babylonians. He had been commanded by God to do so. And he sent word to Josiah that that was his intent. And so Josiah went out to meet Nico and they had this unique conversation where the Pharaoh, who believed in all kinds of other gods, said, your God has commanded me to do this. He is sending me on this mission. And yet Josiah would not listen. He did not want a foreign army going through his kingdom. It would be dicey. There would be too many dangers. Too many things could go wrong. And that's very understandable. You wouldn't want a foreign army going through your country. And so he opposed the idea. And Nico says, stop opposing God. This is what God is commanding. He's teaching us a couple of things here. First, God can work through and speak through even those who do not believe. It's maybe not the usual way, but God can speak to us in that way. We just simply need to make sure and confirm it with the Word of God, that it is something that is not in conflict with our scriptures. And then the second thing is this, opposing God still affects us today. We can oppose God actively, or we can oppose God passively. We can be passive aggressive toward God. It might be something like worship. We can actively oppose coming to worship or we can passively oppose God and worship. It could be using our spiritual gifts and our talents for the building up of God's people and God's kingdom. It might be surrendering ourselves and our will to God and aligning our will with his will. It might be making the sacrifices 
with our time, our talents, and our treasures. It is all of these things where we can actually oppose God, whether actively or passively. That is a challenge for us. And it can have devastating consequences. And it did for Josiah. He opposed the idea. And in fact, he went so far as to go into battle with the army of Nico and the Pharaoh and all those soldiers there. And he tried to disguise himself as Ahab had done previously. He tried to disguise himself in battle so that he would not be killed. But instead, the words that Nico had said to him earlier, that if you oppose God, you will be destroyed. And so an arrow was shot, it was not even intended for him, but it struck Josiah and he died. He opposed God and he suffered the consequences. He tried to disguise himself but it did not work. Why did God want the army of Pharaoh to go through Judah? It was possibly to fight the Babylonians. Because what happens later? Josiah reigned from about the year 640 to 609 BC. After Josiah dies, his son takes over for a couple years but his reign is then replaced by the Egyptians who put in some puppet kings. And then the Babylonians came and conquered the land and they inserted their own puppet kings and then took the people into exile. Had the Egyptians been able to go up and fight, maybe the Babylonians do not capture Judah. Maybe the people do not get exiled, which happened in the year 587 BC, just a few years after Josiah's death. And so we see how God is at work in this situation and how hope seemed to have been lost. Josiah was considered the good king. He was the last of the good kings. He was the last hope for the, the nation <coughs> as they were struggling. And so that's where the people were, in exile shortly and without much hope. If you were watching the World Baseball Classic, and if you saw that championship game, Team Japan against Team USA, you know that it was also a close game. Three to two, Team USA was up last in the bottom of the ninth inning. They were trailing by that run and there were two outs and two teammates who played for the Los Angeles Angels were facing each other. Shohei Otani for Team Japan was pitching and Mike Trout, probably the best player in all of baseball, was at bat, two outs. He was their last hope. But Otani struck him out to end the game, to bring victory to Team Japan, but Team USA lost. He was their last hope, and he failed. And so it is with the Kings. So it is with so many things that we try to do to connect to God, our own efforts, our own strength. It's hopeless and we fail and we lose that hope. But God has given us a greater hope, a greater King, King Jesus, our eternal King our King who comes to us during this season of Lent to remind us of repentance and restoration and renewal and hope so that we may rejoice in the future, 
Jesus came to be our Savior. He came to suffer on the cross. He came to bear our burdens. When he was confronted in the Garden of Gethsemane, he did not wear a disguise, but he freely, willingly was arrested. He willingly gave up his life on the cross so that his death might be beneficial to us in an eternal manner. Jesus Christ, our Savior, he is our eternal hope. He is our eternal king. He is the one who will reign over us. And we can rejoice in that promise that he has made for us. We rejoice in all that he has promised for all eternity. The book of Revelation has this beautiful picture of heaven. No more tears, no more pain, no more sin. That is what we look forward to, not just what is on this earth, but what God has planned for all eternity. For Jesus is not just an earthly king, he is an eternal king who has an eternal kingdom for all of us, for all who would believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. As we come before our Lord during this Lenten season, we place our hope in our Savior, knowing that he loves us unconditionally, just as we are. He is the one we can trust and put our hope in. He is one who will uplift us and bless us and remind us of his forgiveness and his promise for all eternity. The hope is not lost. We have the eternal hope in Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, by his power, for his glory. Amen. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, for our sake, your hearts and minds, in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.